I will be presenting the Human Immune Monitoring Shared Resource this morning. And I just wanted to first thank the Cancer Center for inviting us to come in um, and put this together. I wanna thank the Cancer Center for their support. Over the last two years, um, we became a Cancer Center Corps and their support has been really um, invaluable to our continued success. We were started by the Human Immune uh, immunology immunotherapy initiative. This is one of the Dean's initiatives um, started in 2016 and we've really grown a lot since then, expanding both our services, our available instrumentation and our staff. So our goal at the HEMSER is to provide basic and clinical science researchers with cutting edge immune monitoring assays that are essential for continued advancement of immunotherapies. So really we perform any assay in our lab that is related to the immune system. Um, in any way. And I'm going to kind of take you through everything this morning. None of this would be possible without our just most excellent staff. Um, I can't say enough good things about um, all of our staff. So um, Jill Slansky is our uh, director of the Corps. I'm the assistant director. And Angie has just uh, recently this summer become our project manager. And we are really the three main people that you would contact if you're interested in learning about our services. Um, the rest of our staff are just absolutely essential. Um, we are sort of operating at the limits of their capability almost all of the time. Um, just very, very busy. And if they didn't work so hard, it just wouldn't happen. So I'm very, very thankful to all of their efforts and their interest in cross training um, across all of these assays. Many of them have expertise in certain areas, but they're always willing to jump in and do other things, which is just amazing for our success. So um, at the HEMSER, we do, as I mentioned, a lot of different um, immune-related assays that'll kind of take you through today um, one by one. Um, as I mentioned, we were established in 2016. Largely the infrastructure for our laboratory was established by the Dean's Initiative. Um, and then we became a UCC resource um, just in 2020, just in time for the, the last round of reviews, which was a wonderful experience actually. We got to have a very good insight into how Cancer Center Shared Resources work and how um, the Cancer Center supports their shared resources as well through that process. And I could say a lot of things, but um, Jill really was integral in putting this video together. Um, we we kind of worked on this right as the pandemic was beginning um, and we kind of worked on it through as we were shut down. And I could say a lot of words, but this video is gonna accomplish a lot of things in a very short amount of time. So I hope this works the first time I've tried it. Does the immune system interact with ovaries? Do immune cells influence my patient's heart condition? Is the immune response in my adrenal cancer patients affected by chemotherapy? These are a few of the countless questions University of Colorado scientists and clinicians are bringing to HEMSER, the Human Immune Monitoring Facility, a shared resource at Anschutz Medical Campus. Working with HEMSER, you can now drive new scientific discoveries, even if you don't have a lab. We have some of the most advanced instruments available to discover the role of the immune system in the biological processes you study. We can help you design experiments and carry them out for you because learning how the immune system affects your field can have profound effects on your research and your patient's outcomes. For data you can interpret, publish, use in grant applications, or to further understand your patient's condition, bring your human samples to HIMSER, where the questions you can ask are as unlimited as your imagination. Contact HIMSER today, where samples become science. That was just a little fun tidbit, but um, I think that video really summarizes a lot of what we do. So um, in a very short amount of time, and um, that's available on our website as well. So just to give you a little bit more insight into the details about um, all of the things that we do in the lab, you would not uh, imagine how many times people have come to me with a set of samples sitting in their freezer that um, they wanna do flow cytometry with, or they wanna do some other assay with. And I have to tell them, actually, that's not been prepared correctly. It's not possible to do those assays with the way that you stored your samples. 
So high quality immune monitoring really starts with sample preparation and thinking about your study ahead of time to really plan out what your goals are for the study and what kind of assays you ultimately want to do. So you may approach the BBSR um, to work on study design and they're really um, at the beginning of a study like that would help you with like power calculations and how big your study needs to be and the overall structure of your study. Um, what we can help you with at the HEMSER is more experimental design. So how do I answer my immune related questions? What types of samples are appropriate and which assays are feasible? And this is really an important conversation for us to have before you start your study so that we can ensure whether you're doing the sample processing or you're gonna give us the samples to do the processing that the assays you ultimately have in mind are appropriate for um, the samples that you are gonna be storing. We um, work very closely with the pathology shared resource um, to coordinate these studies. So they actually um, coordinate all of the sample intake from the clinic. They annotate patient charts, they de-identify the samples for us and then transfer the samples to us for um, sample processing for the studies that that's appropriate for. They provide collection kits and they coordinate with um, for offsite transfer if that's necessary for your study. So we have a really good working relationship with the pathology shared resource and we're really integrated um, in that way. Once the samples come in um, on the day that they're collected from the clinic, they do transfer the blood samples to the HEMSER. We perform a lot of sample processing. So um, pretty much anything that's appropriate for your downstream masses, such as FICOL gradients or spinning CPT tubes, but the ultimate goal is to make an appropriate form of a sample aliquot that's gonna be compatible with the immune related assays that you wanna do downstream. So for example, PBMC aliquots um, in live freezing media, if you wanna be able to stimulate those cells later on to assess function um, or plasma aliquots for cytokine analysis. We could also um, dissociate tissue if you have access to fresh tumor samples, for example, um, or perform some of the assays actually need to be performed on the day of sample collection. So we can do cell stimulations on the day that the, the samples are collected and then cryopreserve those in an appropriate format for downstream assays. And then lastly, some assays also require DNA and RNA extraction, which we're capable of doing. Many of these samples um, will end up getting three or four tubes of PBMC and the investigator may only have plans for one of those tubes, for example, for a cytop experiment or something along those lines. So if they're in their, in their protocol, they're allowed to do long-term biobanking, those samples are transferred back to PSR for the long-term biobanking um, and, and their system of organization. We have a good working relationship with them in, that, in those terms. Okay, so one of the first assays I wanted to talk to you about was um, nicely introduced by Eric in his discussion, um, which um, are assays that sort of end in flow cytometry as their major readout. So what we can do um, are you know, whole blood or PBMC stimulation assays. This is really looking at the function of the immune system um, and cells in the immune system. All of these assays are really customized to according to what you need. So are you interested in monocytes or are you interested in T cell responses um, or B cell responses? It, what you stimulate those cells with depends on what types of cells you're interested in um, analyzing their function. We customize antibody panel design. Um, we have a standard set of flow cytometry panels that we use regularly, um, but these are customized really to the investigator's needs um, and according to what those cells are stimulated with as well. And then we actually perform the sample staining, the surface markers um, for surface markers, signaling molecules or cytokines, depending on the assay. And we can perform these stimulations in pretty much any format. So we have a smart tube base station, um, which is a really nice kind of automated format. We can use regular old culture tubes or in a, in a 96 well plate. And then we have um, also performed LE spots, proliferation assays, and killing assays, although not terribly regularly, we do have those assays available in our wheelhouse. So once we have those panels or the samples prepared, those are handed off to the flow, cytom flow cytometry shared resource. Um, we have access to their instrumentation. Sometimes our staff operates those instruments, sometimes their staff, depending on availability. Um, but the, the actual analysis um, or the actual acquisition of the samples is done on the flow and mass. 
mass cytometers that are located in the flow cytometry shared resource. And again, we perform customized panel design, sample preparation, and custom antibody preparation for CyTOF. So this is very different from the services that um, Eric presented, um, where they are really concentrated on the instrumentation. We're really concentrated on the upfront sample preparation for investigators that don't have the expertise to perform those types of um, analyses or don't have a lab themselves. So a lot of our, a lot of our um, work is done with clinicians that don't necessarily have uh, a wet bench lab to do these kind of experiments in. So on the right here is shown an example of an analysis of a, a CYTOF panel. Um, and if you think about CYTOF in, in looking at kind of a global overview um, of the immune system, we also have available panels that sort of break this down into smaller chunks that we can run on the, the uh, traditional flow cytometers. Um, this is now we're trying to get some of our um, as are some of our panels also designed for the new um, spectral flow cytometers, which are a little bit larger in size, um, but that's an ongoing process, of course. So we can break down those those um, different subsets of immune cells into T cell phenotyping and activation panels, a B cell phenotyping panel, a monocyte and DC panel. And then of course, we also have the signaling and cytokine production panels available for looking at those functional assays by flow. We also coordinate with the genomic shared resource a lot. So this is kind of an ongoing theme for us where <laughs> we are doing the sample preparation, we're really taking control of those samples and helping guide those samples into their ultimate downstream analysis. Um, so we, we don't wanna duplicate resources on our campus at all. We're trying to help investigators really take advantage of all the high, high tech um, instrumentation that's available. Um, and if they don't have expertise in those um, areas or don't have access to those instruments themselves because they don't have a wet bench, for example, um, then we kind of take care of that sample prep for them and can hand off and coordinate with these other resources. So for the genomic shared resource, um, we perform RNA and DNA isolation. Many times that comes downstream of cell sorting. When the cell sorting can be done in the flow core, um, as well as we have access to the Milteni Automax for sort of bulk cell enrichment um, purposes. And we've worked on projects several times where we've you know, separated just basic T cells from monocytes, um, from granulocytes, and those are ultimately gonna be used for RNA-seq projects. Um, another example would be a specific tetramer sort. So looking for antigen-specific T cells that can then be used for um, either single cell RNA-seq or TCR sequencing assays downstream. But either way, we can perform the cell um, preparation and the DNA or RNA isolation. Another assay that we've recently brought to the camp or brought to our core is the nanostring encounter assays. So these sample preparations can come from either PBMC or from fixed tissue. Um, so from FFPE tissue, we can extract the RNA from those types of samples and then run them on uh, the gene sets on the nanostring encounter that's located at the VA. Um, we have a working relationship with them to have access to their instrument. We also perform immunoassays. So we have standard color metric ELISAs, of course, but the main platform that we use in our lab are, is mesoscale discovery, which is a high plex multiplex cytokine array. And the way that it works is each of the analytes are spotted onto one of these 10 spots on the plate. So each well has the capability of measuring up to 10 analytes in a sample. And each sample is about 25 microliters per well. So it's a pretty small volume to measure a large amount of cytokines. The reason we choose the MSD platform is that it has a very high level of sensitivity. It has a very wide uh, standard curve range, meaning that we don't have to necessarily mess with the dilution of the samples to, to have the samples fall within the standard curve range um, of the assay. There's definitely exceptions to that, but. Um, for the most part, we can run their standard recommendations and it works really well. Um, we, can, we perform full service assays, so we can run, read, and analyze your samples um, on this platform. With the VPLEX platform, they have up to 68 validated human analytes. They also have mouse analytes available. We run mouse assays all the time on this platform. Um, and then they have other formats where they have well over 200 analytes available. Um, they're just on different 
formats. Uh, so we have to like coat the pleats, for example, um, and actually perform the whole sandwich, Eliza. Whereas the V-plex assays are pre-coated on the well and they're standardized across, um, across different lots. So that makes it really consistent. Where we have really formed a niche and what we have really contributed to the campus in terms of new technology is in the analysis of tissue microenvironments. When we first started in 2016, the very first instrument that we acquired was the Akoya Vector 3 instrument, which at the time was very, very advanced. Um, Multispectral imaging, um, so very similar to some of the technology that's available in the flow core. Um, but this actually analyzes tissue samples. So almost all of our assays are geared towards uh, formalin fixed tissue. And the reason that we have to do that on these instruments is that the process is a serial IHC. So there's multiple antigen retrievals happening during this protocol. And the tissue, if it's FFPE fixed, actually makes it through the end of the protocol. If it's not FFPE fixed, so it's, if it's like fresh frozen, it tends to slough off the slide and doesn't make it through the whole process. Um, the Vector3 is an automated scanner. Um, it has a 200 slide stacker, so it's very high throughput. Um, and it has up to a 20x resolution, so 0.5 micron resolution. Just in the last two years, with the help of the Cancer Center, we um, also purchased an Akoya Vector Polaris. This is an upgrade of the Vector3. The main feature is that with the Vector3, we have to perform um, regions of interest. So we do a whole slide scan that gives you kind of a picture of the tissue and then the investigators have to go in and select where in the tissue they want to go back and do multispectral imaging. With the Vector Polaris they've added two additional filters to the unit so that we can actually now do whole slide scanning with six markers of interest plus DAPI. That means the entire slide, the entire tissue area is quantifiable. The other advantage is that we can actually increase the number of markers. So if, if you're okay with scanning regions of interest, we can actually do multispectral imaging with up to eight markers plus DAPI on the Polaris. So it really expanded our capability um, in both terms. It's a slightly smaller slide cassette, but really we haven't found that this is a limiting, great limiting step. And it does have a higher resolution capability. So the Polaris has actually also opened up the possibility of doing um, ish probes um, on this instrument. And with our auto stainer, the Leica Bond, we have the ISH protocols built in. So if you're interested in looking at up to four color ACD ISH protocols, we can run those right off the bat um, and visualize those with our 40X objective on the Vector Polaris. We are working on co-staining assays um, where we can stain both protein and um, ISH probes at the same time on the same slide. We're having a little bit of technical difficulty developing our first couple of panels, but we're working through that um, and working with ACD and Akoya to try to come up with a solution. Um, so anyway, we hoped in the near future to have those kinds of assays available. On these platforms, we have developed over 300 customized panels for both human and mouse FFPE tissue. And we are really recognized as one of the um, main sites in, in North America that um, by Akoya that do these kind of customized assays. So you guys have available an amazing resource. We keep building on our previous knowledge. We're getting better and better at developing this customized panels the more that we do. But you also have access as an investigator to any of the customized panels that we've already developed. If you have a set of slides that you're interested in, in analyzing and you want a quick turnaround, the way to go is to, to look at one of our customized panels that we've already developed and you know it's kind of off the shelf, if you will. Um, we also have uh, partnered with IonPath to become a beta test site for the MIBI instrument. And then last year we upgraded to their commercial IonPath MIBI scope instrument. This is a very high parameter instrument. You can think of it like Eric explained how um, flow and mass cytometry works. You can think of the MIBI scope as kind of the mass cytometer of visualizing tissue microenvironments, whereas the Vectra and Vectra Polaris are sort of the flow cytometers <laughs> um, of visualizing microenvironments. So with heavy metal conjugated ions, very, or antibodies very similar to the CYTOF te technology, um, we can visualize metal conjugated antibodies on tissues. So this is a, a mass spec unit 
And the way it works is the ion beam uh, rasters across the tissue and essentially every pixel of that tissue is then analyzed in the mass spec unit. It's pretty high resolution, um, almost similar to the 40X objective on the Polaris. Um, it does use targeted regions of interest. So this is not a whole slide um, scanner. And the way to make the MIBI a higher throughput instrument is to come up with a tissue micro array where you have multiple tissues on a slide. And that's really the way to make this more affordable and also um, more high throughput. We currently have a 32 marker backbone uh, for human FFPE tissue. IonPath has several mouse antibodies available and we are working with Dennis Roop's group to uh, develop an, a more extensive list of mouse antibodies that will be available shortly for the MIBI. So we have also become a step program partnership with Akoya. This is giving our investigators here access to the Codex instrument. Very similar um, in terms of the number of markers that are available on codex versus the MIBI. So HIMSR is really just serving as sort of the tissue preparation site and liaison to um, Akoya to help our investigators get access to codex. So they, they're basically offering their in-house services for codex um, to our investigators through the STEP program. The investigators that are interested in using this do get 20% off on codex reagents. And they ask, we, we prepare the tissue slides here and then ship them to Akoya for the actual codex. The goal of this program for us was to gather information about who's interested in using codex. And hopefully we, we're hoping to build enough of sort of an interested user base that we could apply um, for some funds to actually acquire this instrument ourselves. There are many other high parameter tissue imaging resources available on our campus, specifically in the gen genomic shared resource. So I'm sure many of you have heard they have a Visium. Um, this is available for both fresh frozen and they've just started working out the FFPE protocols. Um, they actually did an experiment um, in collaboration with, um, with us over the summer um, on FFPE tissue. They can do whole transcriptome in little punches of the tissue. So the little circles are about six millimeters in size. Um, so it's not single cell, but they are coming out with a single cell resolution, um, supposedly in early 2022. So that would be very exciting advancement. So again, this is whole transcriptome. The um, Genomics Shared Resource has also recently acquired a nanostream digital spatial profiler, which um, we're partnering with them to perform the antibody staining. So you can see here that there's multiple colors here available. Um, looks like CK and then maybe a B cell marker and a T cell marker here in this particular image of this tonsil. Um, so we are going to be performing the slide preparation and multiplex like protein staining ahead of this um, technology. Um, and then those slides will be run on the genomic shared resource instrument. So really exciting. It can do either targeted with their encounter um, 800 gene sets or you can do whole transcriptome profiling, which is what the genomic shared resources is, is planning to provide. Um, it is targeted, so again, it's not single cell. It is targeting these little areas, um, which you can use the protein stains to sort of help you pick, or you can pick specific cell types and um, in, in image, for example, only macrophages um, based on these protein stains. So how do these things all work together? Um, so the way that we envision investigators using all of this technology is to first start with a simple h &E. This is really, really important to select cases and regions of tissue that are viable and um, that have the tissue features you're interested in analyzing. You could then go on to do a larger spatial gene expression profiling on one of these larger um, uh, technologies. And then you could envision that someone may go to either MIBI or Codex for a high parameter single cell analysis. This is really important for immune cells in particular, um, because with these other, pro these other um, technologies that aren't necessarily single cell, it's really difficult to pick apart, you know, are the T cells activated? Are the B cells making a particular antibody? It's really hard to tell when you don't have that single cell capability. Neither the MIBI or the Codex is a high, or a high throughput technology. So that's really where you could take your subset of antibodies, hopefully at that point, narrow it down to up to eight, 
and do a very high throughput analysis and high whole slide analysis on the vector Polaris um, as a confirmation, um, but also as a larger study and confirmation. And lastly, the HEMSER does primary data analysis. So we're not gonna do these technologies and just throw a bunch of data at you and expect you to know what to do with it. Um, for each of the experiments that I've outlined today, we have specific software that can address those needs. We're gonna give you the primary data analysis if you need it. We can give investigators the raw data if they prefer to do the analysis themselves, that's totally fine. Um, but we can also do that primary data analysis for you. The difficult part is integrating all of that together. And that's really where the BBSR comes in, um, who can help sort of put all these things together um, once we've done the primary data analysis um, for them to do the statistics and the comparisons and you know, combining these multiple studies together um, is really where, they, where their expertise comes in. We also have training available. So um, if you're interested in learning how to do, for example, image analysis on the Vector3 and Vector Polaris yourselves, we have lots of resources available for that too. So I wanted to give one example, recent example of a study. Um, this was done with Ben Bittler, where we um, were attempting to identify novel uh, just changes in the tumor microenvironment that were induced by chemotherapy treatment. So in the HEMSER, we performed a pro-inflammatory cytokine array. We performed a nanostring analysis um, using their IO360 panel, and we did some IHC in confirmation of those. So what we found from the um, cytokine array was an increase in IL-6 in pretreatment ascites fluid in patients that had a shorter time to recurrence. So um, these were patients that had a worse prognosis. And we also found that IL-6 was upregulated in, um, in our nanostring um, analysis following chemotherapy. It was actually the most upregulated gene that we found in the nanostring analysis. So that suggested that something was happening, um, you know, in a pro-inflammatory environment in the tumor. And we went on to um, identify that um, IER3 was also the most correlated to the increase in IL-6. So on this gene array, we found that um, IER3 and IL-6 correlated. We confirmed the IER3 expression by IHC. So this is just showing an H score is the, uh, is the way that we score these tissues. And we use this using, do this using a COIAS software. So a low H score, just an example, um, a medium H score and a high H score. And then we found that that H score actually correlated with um, changes in the immune infiltrate. So here on the left is showing a tumor that had a low IER3 H score and that that tumor actually had a higher infiltrate of CD8 T cells, um, specifically expressing granzyme B, granzyme B8, indicating that they're an activated T cell phenotype, versus the higher IER3 um, scored tumors had low, lower infiltrate, most of which were macrophages. So this is showing, this study just highlights how you can kind of take all of these different types of data and integrate them together to really create a story about your particular disease. Um, I just wanted to give a couple of announcements that um, if you're interested in this multiplex imaging type analysis, we do have a monthly seminar series that happens the first Thursday of every month at 2 p.m. It is going back to in-person um, RC1 South ninth floor conference room, but we also have a, a, a Zoom, a virtual Zoom available. The next seminar will be presented by Chris Rickert and Mansori in my lab, and they're gonna be talking about their own in-house um, developed algorithms that they've, they've developed these novel algorithms for image analysis. And very important because the MIBI didn't come with uh, software built in like the Acquia system did. So um, very important for us to have developed our own analysis pipeline. It is agnostic to the different um, technology that you use. So it can be used on codex data, it can be used on Polaris data or maybe data, but they're gonna talk about the updates that they've had and really the presentation of the entire workflow that they've developed. We're also going to be hosting a new image analysis workshop in December. So we have videos available online for Inform version five. They've come out and released a new version six to us as a preview. And it has some really nice features in it. And um, it's going to necessitate me kind of redoing those training videos. But that we're going to have um, a live image analysis workshop in December. That announcement will be made at our multiplex 
seminar series and on our website. But if you're interested in either of these things or learning more about our services, you can contact myself, my email's listed here, or Angie, who's our project manager. We also have our website available here. And our physical location is RC1 North on the eighth floor. So we're in the Department of Immunology and Microbiology. Um, the lab number is 8403. And then we also have a sample Dropbox location, which has been really convenient for um, people needing to drop off slides or samples to us. And that's located right outside the Hansel Phelps Auditorium um, in room 1002. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Uh, Kim, you mentioned uh, the 300 plus panels, uh, customized panels that you have for Vectra. So uh, for someone who's who wants to, to do Vectra, how, you know, how, how do they engage with that? Or is that, does that start with a conversation with Angie or yourself? Or is there a database? Yes. Yeah. There is a list of antibodies available on our website. Um, so we have a list of it's probably close to like 120, 120 human antibodies and then around 80 mouse antibodies. Those are listed on the website. There's a link to uh, a document there. But usually people will approach us. It's just a lot to dig through 300 panels to find the ones that sure. closely match what you want. So usually people send us a list of here's the eight antibodies I want to look at. What panels do you have that are you know close to this? And that's generally how we we do it. Thanks. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, thank you all. This has been really nice. Um, please feel free to contact me or Eric if anybody has any questions about our facilities. And um, we're looking forward to working with you all. Thank, thank you to you both very much. That was just great.